All right, everybody. It's uh, Logan Alec here. Today, I'm speaking with Cassidy Tuttle, who owns the popular blog, Succulents and Sunshine. And we're going to talk to her about her business, how she grew her blog, how she's growing her revenue streams as a business owner in a very specific niche. Hi, Cassidy. Hey, thanks for having me on. You're welcome. Thank you for coming on. So uh, let's get right into this. What compelled you to start a, a blog about succulents. Your blog is called Succulents and Sunshine. You educate people about how to grow succulents, how to propagate succulents. You even have a course about succulents. How did you get into this? So for me, it started um, kind of in school. So I have a bachelor's degree in photography. I've always loved photography all growing up. Um, I had actually a digital camera before they had LCD screens on the back, before they were even a megapixel. Super fun. But um, after I graduated, I was working for a company doing a bunch of shots for their e-commerce store. And I was doing just some other clients on the side. And I was just, I started looking into online business and kind of at the same time or around the same time, one of my cousins had succulents in her wedding bouquet and I'd seen them pop up in magazines a little bit here and there. So I was kind of piqued my interest and I started looking into it more. And then a few months later, it was like a super gray day in January or February. I bought my first succulents and I started looking online to see how to take care of them, what I should do for them. And I didn't find any information that was as detailed as I wanted for growing them indoors. Mm. So at the time, and to some extent still, most of the most of the guidelines for growing succulents were really catered towards someone who lives in Southern California or a fairly temperate climate. So I just started taking pictures of them. I had a photography blog set up to um, just have my portfolio and show clients. So I started posting just little updates on my succulents. And then I started learning about search engine optimization. I'm like, oh, this is cool. This, this sounds like a fun thing to try out. So I put analytics on the photography blog and found out that I was actually already getting search traffic mm. for these little posts about succulents without knowing what I was doing. And interestingly enough, wasn't really getting any traffic to the photography stuff. So I thought, well, everyone's trying to find a niche or, you know, that's like what everyone's telling you, figure out something you can write about. So I figured since I already had that, I would just kind of dive deeper and see what I could do. And really it just kind of built from there. I started learning more about SEO, started learning more about online business. And then in a point with this, with my main client where they were either going to bring someone on full-time or bring me on full-time. Um, but I was working part-time and basically getting paid full-time. So for me, it wasn't worth staying on. And that was kind of my transition point where I talked to my husband. I'm like, so what if I just do this blogging thing for a little bit? Um, he had some funding for school through the summer. And so I'm like, we'll just see what happens over the summer. If it works great, if not, I'll go back to finding more clients. And by the end of the summer, I had gone from making a hundred dollars a month to about a thousand dollars a month. So it was a pretty exciting start and basically just kept going from there and realized I don't like working for other people. I really like working for myself and I love all of the things to learn and do with an online business. So between the start of the summer, you said you're making a hundred dollars a month. And then by the end of the summer, you're making a thousand dollars a month. Okay. So yes. let's, let's back up your hat. So this is, <laughs> is this is with the, the photography blog, the second oh. post on the photography blog. Good question. So just before I made that jump, so I, I started posting on the photography blog in 2012. I maybe had like 10 articles on there about succulents. So it was actually, um, I think it was February, 2013. I, I bought the domain succulentsandsunshine.com and I moved everything over there, set up all the redirects. So there was still some juice from you know, already having it set up before. So I wasn't starting a hundred percent from scratch at that point, but it was a new domain. And then basically from February onward is when we started monetizing it and really trying to drive more traffic. We will talk about all your revenue streams in a second, but right now I just want to know, how did you make your first dollar 
from your blog. Do you remember? Um, so I put Google AdSense on the blog and a friend of mine was really curious about online business. And so she just went to my website and she clicked on every single ad that she saw. <laughs> so there was one day, like I was probably making like a penny a day, maybe. And then one day I made $3 and 51 cents. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, I just made a ton of money. <laughs> and yeah, then it was like the next day when she told me, yeah, I clicked all the, the ads. So hopefully you earned something from that. So that was the beginning. All right. So, so when you were, taking, when you were making a hundred dollars a day at the beginning of that summer, was that pri all primarily from, from AdSense from ads on the site? Yeah. So a hundred dollars a month was just from okay, AdSense. Okay. I'm not, sorry. I, I think yeah. I all right. And then by right. the, by the end of summer, was that the th when you hit a thousand dollars, basically 10 X your income in the span of a few months from this, from the site was yep. that, did you have other revenue streams at that point? Or is that all pretty much all uh, display ads, AdSense as well? At that point, um, so at the beginning of the summer, I wrote an ebook and we launched it, I think in the middle, maybe to the end of the summer. And so that was what pushed us from, um, from that hundred dollars to a thousand and it had its ups and downs from there, but total that first year. So in 2013, we made just over $10,000 between wow. ads and eBooks. And would you say, I know this is a long time ago, but what would you say the revenue split was between ads and, and ebook? Ooh. Yeah. Our traffic started picking up. I would, I would guess it was probably like 30% ads, 70% ebooks. Okay. All right. It could, could have been closer to 50, 50, but. So, so takeaway here is uh, don't, <laughs> if, if ads and display ads are the only way you're monetizing your blog or, you know, your YouTube, whatever it is, there's probably a whole larger pot of gold out there uh, with your own products. Yes, that for kind of sure. Statement? Okay. Um, okay. So then kind of take me with me here. When did, uh, so you're making a thousand dollars a month by the end of the summer. And then when did you actually start creating this course? Because it's my understanding that this course you have is the, the main revenue driver for your business, business now. When did that come to be? So that happened in 2016. Okay. So kind of toward the end of the summer, um, I'd had this idea for a while to do the course and we filmed it in the summer. And I believe our first launch was in November. So November, 2016 would have been like the big, the big day. And my goal, I actually had invested, I don't know, in my mind, it was a lot of money, depending on where you're at in your journey. It may not have been, but I invested about $6,000 in putting the course together between just like buying a bunch of plants and supplies and then hiring a videographer and editor to actually make it look nice. Cause up to this point, I've been doing everything myself. So my goal with that first launch was just to break even. I'm like, if I can make that $6,000 back in the first launch, we'll be good. And then everything from there on out is just basically profit at that point. Did you recoup your investment from that launch? We were just shy of 6,000. Okay. It was pretty All close. Right. So at this point, so 2013 is summer 2013, right? That we talked about going from a hundred to a thousand a month. So three yep. months, be the three months between that point and was it November, 2016, you said with the launch? Yeah. So, so in those and three and years, years, in those two and a half, three years at that point, uh, was the blog just kind of chugging along? Like you were increasing in rankings in Google, you were getting ad revenue, you know, selling your, e selling the ebook. So those were the two revenue streams basically for, for the first few years. And then, yeah. then you created the course, uh, invested $6,000 into the course. You almost recouped it all. So at that point where you, did you feel when you didn't quite recoup all your investment, did you, how did you, how did that make you feel at that point? And how did you go, how did you move forward? Well, if I'm being honest, I was really hoping for 10 K plus. Okay. So it was, but at the same time, I was really excited that like it did actually sell and I could see the potential there because we'd tested out some other just little things that had done. Okay. Not great. But with this, we got enough sales and we were close enough to recouping that cost that I, I felt good about it. And I knew that it would be really just an asset for the long run. And is the course that you sell today, is it pretty much that original, just another iteration of that original course, the core content is pretty much 
the same, not the same, it's, but it's, it's, it's the heart of it's the same. Uh, it's about 90% exactly the same. Wow. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. I, so we've added a few, we've added a few things. We've cleaned up a couple things, but it's the, the core of the course is that original footage. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So today, what, so today, what are your revenue streams? I, I do you still have ads on the site. Yes. So we okay. do still have ads. You have uh, the course, obviously you mm-hmm. have the, uh, do you have, do you have any affiliates or. Yep. So one of the big kind of turning points, at least in my mind was, I, I want to say it was 2014, 2015. I started looking more into affiliate programs and found out that Etsy had an affiliate program Mm. and people sell succulents on Etsy. So that was a huge step for us to be able to actually sell plants. And now a good chunk of our affiliate income is through online plant or online succulent sellers. Okay, cool. So I think the current breakdown for this year, 2019 looked quite a bit different, but this year our breakdown is about 60% sales of our own product. And then it's kind of a toss up on affiliates and ads. They really fluctuate, but I'd say about like a 2020 split. So you have the course, do you have a, do you have, do you sell the ebook? So we have a set of four ebooks and then we also have what we call the types of succulents ID cards. So it's a digital download, but it has a photo of a succulent and its name. And then details about like how much light and water it needs, dormancy, propagation, toxicity, things along that line. Kind of just like if you bought the plant, here's the quick look at what you need to know about it. Okay. And that's, that is actually our main revenue driver in terms of like the products that we sell. It is just above the course. So we sell a lot more of those, but it does come in just ahead of the course. This is, this is a digital download. How did you create that? Yeah. So in terms of information, it was just a lot of research combining reliable sources and putting it all into one place. But then the actual product itself is a PDF or you can also download JPEGs and we created it in InDesign. Okay. Got it. Did you, did you do that yourself or did you hire somebody to to do that? (laughs) The actual. That's a great question. A little bit of both. So we currently now have two full-time employees. So with this project specifically, um, my assistant puts together the cards every week um, we we've been trying to release one a week for all of 2020. Um, so I, I built out like the design or the framework, and then she's actually the one creating them and okay. updating and all of that. If you had to guess how many hours of your personal time did you have to invest in, in creating <laughs> that course? I mean, what are we talking like hundreds of hours or is this something you're able to do, you know, put together? I mean, if you just put together all the hours cumulative, cumulatively, you know, is this something that someone could theoretically put together a course like this in, in a week or two? A week or two might be a stretch. Okay. I guess it depends on if you're working full time on it. I will say one of the things that was helpful for me when I started is I knew the material that I wanted to cover. I was mm-hmm. really familiar with it. So sitting down to write the scripts was pretty quick. I would say I probably wrote the scripts in two to three hours and then, wow. you know, a couple hours of revision and all of that. It took us two full days to take two. Two, one and a half days, I guess, to film it, but total in getting it all set up and back and forth and everything. I mean, we've probably spent 60 to a hundred hours on that, like initial push to get it going. So did you say you wrote, you wrote the, the scripts for all of your lessons in a few hours? Just, yes. Just because you knew the material that well, you knew exactly what you wanted to cover. Yep. Did you know, did you have this kind of knowledge or intuition or of what you wanted to cover because of what was ranking in search, what you knew, what people were searching for, what your audience was telling you, how, how, how did you gain that knowledge of, okay, this is exactly what I want in the course. Yeah. I love that question. So I have always tried to be really connected to my audience and we, I love surveys. I love asking people questions. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the course material and the way that I decided to put it together was based on questions that I got all the time via email and then gaps that I could see in like what people know about succulents and what they don't know that they really should know before they get to point B. And then 
it's really a progression. I can just kind of tell you a little about the course. So the course starts with like buying your first succulent because not every succulent is going to be perfect for each person or each climate. And so then it walks through like soil and pottery and where you're going to put the succulent, how much light it needs. And so just trying to really build the whole foundation up to the point where we get to watering, which is where everyone struggles. But if you get that first section wrong with which plant and where you're putting it and all that, you're kind of lost. So then we got to watering and then kind of maintenance after that. So for me, it was like, if you're starting from scratch, you don't know anything, here's what you need to know in the right order, um, kind of start to finish to keep your succulents alive. Some of it was things that I don't think my audience realized they needed to know, but I could tell they were missing it from questions I'd asked them mm. or emails they were sending me. Okay. That's still incredible to me that you're able to do scripts in, in two, two to three hours. That's that's, yeah. that's phenomenal. And then, you know, even when you described kind of the back and forth and putting it together, I think you said 60 to a hundred hours or something like this. Like even that seems yeah. very, you know, it, it's, 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 it's not a walk in the park, but it's, it's not, it's not necessarily something that, that you're, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to have to devote like half, half of the, half of my year to, to this creating right. a course, right? It's something you could theoretically do relatively quickly. You did have help though, of course, people you hired to, yeah. to actually do some of that more technical work, but. Um, and part of it too, I think is that the knowledge was already kind of there. It wasn't like I was researching to right. build the course out. And I would think a lot of people are probably at that point where they know what they want to teach. It's just a matter of putting it out, but having a couple years of figuring out what people are interested in and looking up and researching and experimenting myself definitely made a difference too. Let's talk about 2020. Yep. Um, are you willing to share any numbers, top line kind of rough net, and what, what are you looking at in 2020? Yeah. So I'm going to preface that a little bit. Um, okay. so I, so we brought on a second full-time employee this year. COVID was really good to us. People bought a ton of plants and people were so interested in growing plants in 2020. So oddly we saw this little dip at the beginning and then just a massive spike. And it all happened during our typical peak season, which is like April, May, June. And then we had also started running Facebook ads this year, which is not something we'd done in the past. So all that combined, um, we, I think we'll end up doing just over 500,000 in revenue, like top line revenue wow. sales this year between all the different platforms, between product sales, affiliates, um, and then add revenue. Kind of breaking that down. Okay. So you said about 60% of that is sale of your own products, yep. primarily um, that digital download and the course with the digital download kind of edging out the course by just a hair or something like yep. this. So, okay. So we, let's say 500,000. So 60% of your own products, half of that is course sales. Half of that is the digital download. So that's about 30% each for, for those, I suppose. Yep. Okay. So um you're looking at 150,000, let's say in course sales. Yep. Right. Ish. Uh, what is the price point of, of your course? So our course is $127. Okay. Got it. Um, we do have some supplemental products. It feels kind of weird to say that. So we have another smaller course that we offer just on propagating. And then we have the eBooks in there as well. So we have a variety of ways that we're marketing those along with the ID cards and the course. So to say it's like, you know, 150 just for one or the other, not totally true, but essentially. So when people are buying the course, they have the option to also buy the propagation course. When they buy the ID cards, we also say, Hey, do you want to get our eBooks and this propagation course? So we're trying to present them with other products they might be interested in, in the moment, but, okay. um, but yeah, but the numbers are pretty close to that. Wow. Okay. So you roughly uh, approximately a thousand people have bought that course this year. Like yeah. 150 price point, let's say ish. Yep. Wow. Okay. So that is basically an average of let's say three a day. That's, that's like uh, something like that. Right. Yeah. It that's probably an... it's, I guess now that you say that it's probably skewed more towards the other products. I would okay. bet that we've had it's still a good number. I would bet we've had about six or 700 sales. Okay. Like average about two a day. Got it. Okay. So it seems, it sounds like maybe the other products. Okay. The, the digital download, you said other products, so digital download, uh, ebook, you said you sell four ebooks, 
Yep. And then also the propagation course. The propagation course. Okay. Yep. And do you kind of market that as like an upsell? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Got it. Um, And then the affiliates, you said the affiliate is mostly Etsy. So So not anymore. Okay. Um, It was initially, but uh, once succulents kind of became more popular, a lot more online sellers started popping up for succulents. Mm. And so we have a couple sellers that pretty much do only succulents. And so now like Etsy and Amazon, they, we still get revenue from them, but it's a pretty small part of our affiliates. So, um, we sell primarily succulents and then succulent soil are the two main affiliates that we have right now. And these are not on Etsy. So how are, how, are these directly from, I don't even know how the secular market works. So how did, how did, yeah. how, who are, who are these people that you get affiliate commissions for promoting their succulents and, and succulent soil? Yes. Well, if you're interested, um, you can, <laughs> so we have um, mountain crest gardens and leaf and clay is another website. Um, I think they're leaf and co. And then the succulent source, there's another one called Lula's garden that has like some gift box style succulent arrangements. Yeah. With each of them, we're actually using a, they set up the program themselves using a service called affiliately. Hmm. And it's awesome because I personally don't love sponsorships. Um, that's probably a story for another day, but I like the affiliate, uh, relationship better where it's like the more I promote you, the more you benefit. And we kind of, neither of us have a really strong obligation unless people, um, buy purchase. Yeah. So a few people that have approached me saying, Hey, will you promote our product? I'll usually say yes. If you're willing to set up an affiliate program. And by the way, here's five other people in the succulent space who'd probably also want to be an affiliate for you. And you can set it up really easily through affiliately.com. Right. Okay. So yeah, smaller, smaller affiliate programs have actually been um, really helpful for us I see. and good, good for the business, the other businesses as well. Now, in terms of your traffic these days to your site, you said you started running Facebook ads. Now were those mm-hmm. Facebook ads directly to like a sales page for your course or to something else or to some freebie, some opt-in? Both. Okay. So on like the cold traffic end, we're running ads to our freebie so we have a pretty good funnel set up with a free cheat sheet that leads them to the ID cards and to the course eventually. So we are running then pro- um, ads directly to the products as well, depending on where they're at in their journey. Okay. So how much of your traffic, let's say in 2020, was organic, like proportionately, and how much was like paid, uh, like paid traffic from advertising. If you had a guess or ballpark, probably 90% organic. Okay. So it's still most, and most of the organic is search. Yeah. So we okay. we're probably about like 60 to 70% organic search traffic. And then a little bit of Pinterest, a little bit of Facebook and just random referrals. Okay. So the SEO game is still holding strong. Going strong. Um, yep. Uh, has it, has that become more competitive in the past few oh, yes. years since you started in the second space? Okay. So one of my like big proud moments is for about a year, we ranked number one in search for succulents. Really? And that was like, never in my wildest dreams. Did I think we'd get there. Well, in general, the current business setup is way beyond what I ever envisioned. But interestingly, over the last, I would say three years, we've seen a really slow decline in where we rank for the word succulents. And if you do a search for that now, you'll actually see that most of the people in the search are sellers, not yeah. information. And so I've noticed that's the, that's the biggest one for sure. But I've noticed a slight shift on some of our keywords in intent. So initially people were looking up succulents, like what the heck is this? But Mm. now more people know what they are. And so now they just want to buy them. And so I've just noticed this really subtle, very slow change where it, at least that's my interpretation is that the, the search intent has changed for that word. That's fascinating. (laughs) Yeah. It's super frustrating for me because I'm like, dang it. That was like 
so much traffic. But, you know, if, if people weren't clicking through and finding what they wanted, then better for us to not be there. But, um, but yeah, it's just, it's been kind of interesting. I haven't focused a ton on SEO lately, not like I used to, but that was one of like the big, the big aha moments for me in the last couple of years. Okay. I see that. I'm just looking at Ahrefs organic keywords still says your top one is succulents. I don't know if that's still accurate in terms of traffic driven, but you said the searcher intent yep. has changed, which is, which is really interesting. Cause it's like, when I think of search intent, well, I think, you know, in the, in, cause I have a financial blog, it's like, well, you know, the, the search intent when someone types, uh, you know, some financial term, it probably hasn't changed from like four years ago. Right. But with succulents, right. because they are, ha- they had, they're having like this moment um, where maybe five years ago, people didn't know what the heck they were, but now more and more people do. And so the actual intent of someone who's typing succulent has changed from something more seeking information to something more transactional now, which is really just really interesting. But you're, according to Ahrefs, at least your number two uh, oh, keyword is how often to oh. water succulents. And that sounds like right yes. up. That's exactly like your crowd. You want to reach yeah. those people. The nice thing about that keyword the search wow. intent is probably not going to change. Right. Right. Yep. So that's, and those are really, honestly, those are the best ones anyway. I mean, we get, we do still get traffic from the search succulents, but the user behavior is different. The people who come for how to water succulents definitely stick around longer and they're more likely to opt into our email list or purchase a product and just engage a lot more. So at the end of the day, I'll take better traffic over quantity. So your page, okay. So this is, looks like a, you got a lot of images on this page. There's a lot of content. You answer questions. You kind of anticipate what questions people might have about this. And throughout, I see on this page that you are suggesting several times that people grab the, the free cheat sheet. Um, yep. So that's definitely kind of the, the call to action that you want them to take. That's I, had no, I, I didn't know that you rank so highly for so, so many of these uh, very common phrases that I would search if I was getting into succulents, um, how to propagate succulents. You number one for that too. (laughs) So fun fact, that is the first thing that we ranked for propagating succulents is where this whole thing started. Um, some, some version of how to propagate succulents, propagating succulents from leaves, anything along that line. Those were the first keywords that we ranked for. And I felt so proud of myself because they were long tail keywords and like they fit every, every technical SEO right. description in the book. <laughs> right. So, I check all the boxes. Yep. So that was, and thankfully we've actually held that one. We've kind of fluctuated because propagation is a huge part of growing succulents and it's gotten a lot more, everything's gotten a lot more competitive, but people do some really cool things with their leaves when they're propagating. So so these kind of cornerstone pinnacle pieces of the content you have that get a lot of traffic that rank for these very popular keywords, at least in the succulent space, have you had to, so kind of like my similar question with the course, is this more or less the same content that it was four years ago? Or are you kind of always having to constantly update this to kind of anticipate what Google's going to do, what, what searchers want, or is it the same thing it was four years ago? This is something that has changed And partly because one, my knowledge of succulents improved and then also just my writing improved. Mm. Um, So when I say I wrote that script for the course in two hours, I am really good at just dumping things out on the page. It's not very good necessarily, but I'll just throw a ton of stuff out there. (laughs) So editing has not ever been my, uh, my best skill when it comes to writing. So the first especially the watering post, the first couple drafts of that, that actually got published. I didn't like edit them. The ones that went live online and initially started ranking, they were good. They still had good content, but I, in my opinion, they weren't formatted very well in a way that was helpful. Mm -hmm. So I personally don't read articles. I skim. And so for me, that's something that's really important on my website is that you can kind of jump to what you want to know and you can scroll through pretty quick and see what you want. Some of those updates that we've made have been formatting just to make it easier to read. Some of it's been like adding in an opt-in that makes sense with that post. Some of it's been answering questions 
that are related that used to be in an old blog post that was separate because to some extent, six, seven years ago, having more articles was better. Google kind of shifted a little bit to where they liked longer articles. And so we had a couple really short articles about watering that we ended up combining into this one. So it's definitely evolved. I wouldn't say that like I'm updating it every year, you know, I plan on making all these updates or changes. It's more if we notice a problem with it or if we keep getting asked the same question, even after someone's read the blog post, things like that, then we'll make a change. But for the most part, I'm not like rewriting posts just to please Google. It's and and really if you want to please Google, you want to please your reader. And that's really what we've been doing is just I'll I'll write the post, I'll update it. And then I'll come back later to like answer someone's question. I'm like, oh, this sounds really weird. No wonder they couldn't figure that out. <laughs> and so then I'll update a paragraph or two. But if you do that too many times, then the article gets a little bit messy. And so then I've done, I've probably done like two full on rewrites and then just a bunch of updates. So it sounds like kind of these core ideas, maybe it might have been information done before, but gradually over time, you kind of cultivated it as you kind of figured out your writing improved, your knowledge of succulents improved, your the website improved in terms of formatting and things like this. Also, I'm kind of looking at your link profile here. I'm like, I see like sometimes site, these, these very popular sites have like link to a lot of your articles. Like, mm -hmm. and I imagine maybe that's just organic. They type how to water succulents into Google and oh, you're number one. Then they, they, they insert, they link to that uh, in their own article. So that's, that's really cool. <laughs> Yeah, I have not done, I really haven't done any like outreach in terms of link building. In my mind, it's kind of a gray area in terms of SEO. I don't know that Google can like totally track it and tell, but we've really tried to stay like totally white hat with everything SEO. We've never had, we've really never had a major hit from any algorithm update. If anything, we usually get a little boost. Mm -hmm. And I think it all goes back to, yeah, I'm trying to please Google. I'm trying to check all the boxes, but I also want to make sure that it's really helpful for whatever it is that people are searching. Um, cause ultimately if you rank and it's not helping someone, your ranking is going to drop. Would you call your business passive or at least semi-passive at this point? For me personally, it is. Um, so I think I said earlier, we have two full-time employees. So my super assistant who basically does everything that I don't want to do <laughs> or shouldn't be doing. And then we have a full-time customer service person who also takes on some other projects and various things. So that for me enables me to really focus on just doing whatever I want to do. And that's been my goal from day one is to not have to work unless I want to work. And granted there's exceptions to that. Like I do get emails that pretty much only I can answer. And so I'll answer those when they come in, but really for the most part, we could kind of, I mean, we could stop doing whatever our daily activities are. And I think we just keep going for a while. We might have some angry people that are not responding to their emails, but um, traffic would keep coming. Income would keep coming from a variety of sources. So in my mind, it definitely is passive. But again, I do also have two full-time people who make it passive for me. So your, your assistant who you described as uh, this individual does everything, I guess, what is this in, what, it, what are the specific tasks in this individual's job description? I, I imagine some of this is proprietary, but just kind of in general, like what is, what is this yeah. individual doing for 40 hours a week? <laughs> Currently, a lot of it is cleaning up of things. So over six and seven years, seven years of doing this, things have gotten really messy. Hmm. So, but on a regular basis, she is, um, she's managing the inbox. So almost everything goes through her. We do have the customer service person now. So she's taking more of the the harder to answer questions, I guess you could say she's, um, managing that she's handling social media. And then she is actually the main driver behind our types of succulents pages and ID cards. So for those ID cards, I mentioned, we actually have a page on the website 
that also has a bunch of detailed information about those plants. And that project was super research-based, which is not my cup of tea, but right up her alley. So she's been putting a lot of time and research into those, and then she'll present it to me. We'll talk about it. And then it gets put into the card and on the pages, she'll be like posting our YouTube videos and making sure the links are all working and um, creating thumbnails. Just, yeah, a lot of just that everyday stuff and then cleaning up and trying to refine and organize everything to make it run smoothly. Right. Right. Awesome. And how did, how did you find these employees? Was it just posted a job post online? Well, I got really lucky. I will say that. Um, so my super assistant is really good friends with my sister-in-law. And so she had actually gotten laid off and my sister-in-law is like, you've got to hire Chantel. She's amazing. And it, uh, interestingly, the timing wasn't quite right for me, but thankfully a couple months later, she was still looking for something. I was ready to take someone on full time and it has been the best ever. <laughs> we always talk about, she can't ever leave. <laughs> She's not planning to, so it should be good. Um, and then our customer service person is actually my brother. Nice. So he's, he uh, fit the bill and we were in need and he was available and that has actually worked out well. I know that's not the case for a lot of people, but it's yeah. good. No, it's good. It's good. That works out. Family, uh, family business. All right. Let's kind of move on now to talking, addressing specifically those individuals who are hearing your story and they're thinking to themselves like, oh, wow. You know, she, she got into succulents because was it a wedding? Is that what you said? Mm-hmm. Like at a wedding yep. and she got into succulents and, and they're thinking, I have passions like this as well. Like I want to monetize it. So do you think it's a fair statement that any passion somebody has, right? As long as it's something that enough people are passionate about, it's not some like a random thing only they're into. But if there's a general interest among, let's say at least, I don't know, a million people in the country, let's say, um, would you say that they that there is the potential there if they monetize it in maybe the way you have, right? Through a blog, through courses, through eBooks that, you know, that they can have the kind of success you have? Or would you say, well, you kind of have to step back and there's maybe some preliminary qualifications to a particular passion uh, to make it monetizable. I, I am of the opinion and it comes from doing this for so long that anyone should be able to make a living doing something or related to something that they love. For some people, it's probably going to come easier than others, whether it's like they just have the drive and the know-how and they're going to get it done or their niche just lends itself better to generating revenue. So I think it's kind of a combination. We, my husband and I have actually talked a lot about building out other niche sites. Hmm. We haven't really gotten there yet. Although that's one of the plans for 2021. We're finally, we're finally cleaned up enough and running smoothly enough with succulents that we feel like we can um, test the waters out there. Um, So we have looked at it from what are our hobbies? Like, what do we want the business to pay for instead of us to pay for? And how can we make that work? And with some topics, it's definitely easier to find ways to monetize. But with other topics, I think if you just get creative enough, and if there's one thing that 2020 has proved to me is the world can be creative enough to solve a lot of problems. I think you can do you could do just about anything. That's awesome advice. So for somebody who does have a passion for something, right? They want to, they want to monetize it. So your journey was you started, well, you had this photography kind of website that was kind of a backdrop to all this, but then with the succulent aspect, you create these blog posts about succulents. You eventually create a separate domain for succulents. You monetize these succulent blog posts via ads, which is probably let's say that's probably the lowest form of, of uh, how you can make money online. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you gradually kind of went up, went up the ladder, right. You had an an ebook, your own product at at a lower price point. And then you have this course that you sell at a higher price point. Would you say in general, that's, that's, that's kind of the way to do it. Um, for, for the, for kind of these niche sites, for these kind of, uh, niche sites built around a particular passion, um, or do you say, well, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe in some 
areas it makes sense to go directly to the course creation? Or do you, or do you think you kind of need this framework first of a blog and kind of some wide range of content first before you kind of get to that point of, of selling a, a higher priced item? I think it depends a lot on your goals as an individual. So for me, in order to have a passive income, I needed something that didn't require my input. Like it doesn't require me to work all the time. And so starting out with ads, like you said, I think is kind of like the bare minimum. So if we launch a site in the future, I would be looking for affiliate programs that I could work with. I'd be trying to figure out if I could make my own product around it, whether it's a course or, um, or eBooks. Um, cause for me, it would definitely be something digital. So I think it depends on kind of your capacity and then also how you like to show up in the world. Like I know there's a lot of people who never want to show their face on video. Mm-hmm. And so in that case, a video course might not make sense, but maybe they do an audio series, or maybe it's just a course that has text and just walks them through that. So it depends is my short answer, but, um, I don't feel like there's necessarily like a right or wrong way to go about it. Um, I know a lot of people have just started by coaching, just teaching other people and getting paid to do it that way. One of the great things I feel like about the internet right now, unless someone's going to do like a crazy, crazy deep dive into you personally, if someone finds you through a search or through a referral, they won't necessarily know that that was your first blog post or you've only had your website up for two weeks. And so I see a lot of people, they're like, well, I don't want to sell yet because I'm new. I'm like, but who knows that you're new other than you. And if they go look up your domain or if they, you know, if they do some really deep diving and just because you're new doesn't mean you can't sell something. So because of how long it took me to be, um, I've, I've definitely been profitable. We've been paying ourselves the whole time. This has been, this really has been our main income source for at least the last five or six years. But with all that I know now, I wish I would have been a little bit more upfront with selling in the beginning and not worried about it because the people who I've connected with most in my audience are my customers and they are phenomenal. And I love chatting with them and, you know, just, um, hearing their experiences. So I don't think that you have to be shy about selling from the get-go. So I I am shy about selling like my, my businesses right now, if there's a blog, which is mostly affiliate, there's YouTube, which is affiliate slash ad revenue. And I I get these weird hangups about selling. It's like, well, you know, this content, I think I'll just create the content, give it away for free. Right. I can monetize through affiliate and ads you know, personal finance knowledge should be free, you know, like, so how do you, I guess, how would you, how do you know what you want to give away for free and what, what kind of content you're, you're okay with giving away for free and what kind of content you feel good about selling to somebody? How do you kind of draw that distinction? The first thing that popped into my head is my least favorite response. Like people will say, you know, you give for free the why, and then you sell the how. And to me, that's like so abstract. I'm like, <laughs> why do you need to know how to water your succulents so they don't die? <laughs> right. But if you want to know how to water them, sorry, you have to take my course. It just doesn't, it doesn't work. So for me, most of what I sell can definitely be found on the internet at large. Mm. And frankly, it can be found on my blog and my YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. But the ebooks and the course put it all together in one place hmm. with a very clear framework. And I wouldn't say it's longer than it's probably shorter than most of my, like than all of my YouTube videos combined. But for me, it's putting the right pieces together and giving people that convenience of having it all in one place and just being able to follow that system top to bottom instead of okay, I found this watering post. Oh, here's this thing about mealybugs. Oh, but I also needed to know about soil. Hmm. And we, we do link people through to all these articles on our blog. So you could easily go from a watering post to a soil post to a potting post, you know, all of those things are there, but most of our buyers really are looking for like, let's just make this simple and easy. And I don't want to have to go 
look a bunch of places. That's probably the most common theme among like reviews that we got is Hmm. I spent hours watching YouTube videos and searching the internet, but just going through the course, I got it all in one shot and I learned so much more that way. How long, how long would it take somebody to go through your, your course? Do you think on average? If they, if they just watched the videos, I think it's two and a half hours. Okay. It might not be quite that long. Okay. So, so they're paying, they're really paying for the system and the structure that you've given them. How in two and a half hours worth of content, it's A to Z, how to grow succulents. And then the other one, how to uh, propagate succulents without the other mm-hmm. one. Okay. Yep. So, all right. Just to close out here. What is one little known thing about you that you would like to share? <laughs> Fun fact. Um, I used to be terrified of talking to people like high school, junior high, any of the above, I was super shy. And if I had to talk to someone, it would give me like, it wouldn't really give me anxiety, but I would avoid talking to people at all costs. Really? Kind of, <laughs> That's very surprising, actually. Kind of different from now. I finally <laughs> figured it out. And then what is one fun fact, little known fact about succulents that, that you can share? My favorite thing to tell people is that the soil you plant your succulents in is just as important as how often you water it. It actually determines how often you water it. So a lot of people think they're killing their succulents from too much water, but most of the time it's actually that their soil. That's the problem. Interesting. Okay. Okay. We have a succulent wall that died. Okay. Maybe, maybe we need to check out your blog. Your blog, by the way, is succulentsandsunshine.com, right? And uh, where else can people find you online? That's probably the best place, succulentsandsunshine.com or succulents and sunshine on YouTube. All right. Well, Cassidy, thank you so much for uh, taking this hour or so to chat with me. Uh, I learned a lot about succulents and I learned a lot about online business as well. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. Have a, have a great day. You too. Bye-bye.